<laughs> we'll now move on to the main event, chapter two, and then there was JavaScript. Now, if you were here last time, you remember I went through the history of everything that ever happened, starting with the Big Bang, going through the dawn of man, and then finally there was JavaScript. The um, reason I did that was because understanding the context in which this stuff happens um, is really important to understanding what we have now. Um, without that understanding, um, you're sort of consumed by a mythology which has no truth in it, that um, the history of innovation has been one thing after another where the new good thing always displaces the old stuff. That's not how it works generally. Generally, the most important new innovations are received with contempt and horror um, and are accepted very slowly, if ever. And that's an important bit of knowledge to have in the case of JavaScript. It, when you look at um, the way physics is taught, I love that first semester physics is a history class in which you go and visit with um, all of the great physicists in history and look at how they lived and what they added to physics. We don't do that for computer science. We just kind of assume that uh, what we've got is as good as it can get. Um, and I, I think we should be more aware of our own history. So that's why I did that last week. Um, and that's why uh, we're here at JavaScript. Um, having that background allowed me to make the first important discovery of the 21st century, which was that JavaScript has good parts. This was an unexpected um, discovery. Um, and when I tried to share it with the rest of the community, there was a huge amount of skepticism. A lot of people refused to believe that it was possible that JavaScript had any redeeming value whatsoever. Um, but in fact, it has very, very good parts. Um, but I'm getting a little ahead of the story, um, so let's back up a little bit. Um, I want to start at um, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign at the National um, uh, Center for Supercomputing Applications. Uh, where a bunch of kids got together um, and decided to make a web browser based on Tim Berners-Lee's uh, World Wide Web and also to support um, FTP and Waze and Gopher and everything else. Um, and uh, they made the first popular web browser. It wasn't the first web browser. Um, it wasn't necessarily the best web browser, but it was the first popular web browser. And the way they made it popular was they added an image tag to it, which was something that uh, Tim Berners-Lee didn't want, um, or at least didn't want their design. They refused to, to pay any attention to Tim. They did it their way. It was a hit. And it was a hit because you could now make a web page look like what you really wanted. You couldn't actually make what you really wanted, but you could make it look like what you really wanted, and that was enough. And that made it really popular. So um, based on that early interest, Jim Clark, who had been one of the founders of Silicon Graphics, uh, pulled a bunch of those kids out of um, the University of Illinois and set them up um, at a company in Mountain View called Netscape. And Netscape made um, an even more web browser, or more popular web browser, and they made it even more popular by ignoring Tim even more. Um, so they added things that everybody really wanted, like blink tags and format tags. And, uh, scripting, it turned out, and cookies, and a lot of stuff that uh, is still with us things which have gone on to become standards, things which were added without a lot of uh, thought as to its consequences. Um, and so one of the things they wanted to do was to um, put interactivity back into the browser because we had lost interactivity when we went to the browser model. Um, and one of the reasons why Java was uh, getting so much attention was it offered to bring interactivity back because just doing a page replacement in response to a user clicking just wasn't good enough, that that wouldn't compete with desktop applications. Um, and the way they wanted it to work was like HyperCard. HyperCard was um, a system that had been developed by Bill Atkinson at Apple, which um, made uh, Macintosh programming really easy. You could have a bunch of buttons and attach simple scripts to them and cause things to happen. Um, so they wanted to do something similar to that instead of to a stack of cards, as Atkinson had done, to a web page. And in order to do that, they hired this guy, Brendan Eich, who had been at Silicon Graphics, brilliant guy. Um, uh, in his interview, um, he said he wanted to write a scheme interpreter. And they said, that's great. That's just what we want. Um, after they hired them, him, they found out what scheme was. And they said, no, 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 you, you, you can't do that. 
Uh, people won't like that. Do something that looks more like uh, Visual Basic or Java, something people like. Um, so he did that. So he combined elements of three languages, uh, Java because he was told he had to, and two really interesting languages, two failed languages in the sense that they got zero market acceptance, but two brilliant languages and two highly influential languages. So they're known not much to the general programming community, but they're very well known to program language designers. Um, and it was uh, a surprising choice to take features from those two languages. Um, uh, Scheme was a, uh, a dialect of, of Lisp, uh, which was inspired by Carl Hewitt's um, actor model. Brilliant language, probably the best implementation of functions in any language uh, we've ever seen. Self was a brilliant language that came out of um, Xerox Park originally. It was uh, taking small talk and stripping it down to a simpler language in order to make it go faster. And it turned out in, in making it simpler, they actually made it profoundly better. Um, at, that project then moved to Sun Labs. So for a time, Sun was supporting research into both Java and Self. And at some point, Sun made a decision and killed one of them. In my opinion, they killed the wrong one. Self was clearly the, the better language. Um, so uh, Brennan took elements of all three of these languages and, and a little bit of his, his own and put them together into a new language that was called LiveScript. And LiveScript was going to become one of the key technologies for Netscape going forward. It was going to be in uh, Netscape Navigator 2, so you could have LiveScript applications running on the client side and on the server side. The li Netscape's LiveWire server had server-side JavaScript in it. This was back in 95. So, uh, JavaScript was there uh, from the very beginning. Um, it was very clear that um, at the time that there was a lot of excitement about uh, Java and the Netscape browser and Sun and Netscape decided they needed to work together against Microsoft because if they didn't join forces, Microsoft would play them off against each other and they'd both lose. Um, and the biggest point of contention in, in that arrangement was what to do with LiveScript. Uh, Sun's position was, well, we'll put Java into the Netscape browser, we'll kill LiveScript, and that'll be that. And Netscape said no, um, that um, they really believed in the hypercard-like um, functionality. They wanted a simpler programming model in order to capture a much larger group of programmers. Um, and so there was an impasse, and the relationship almost broke up when I think Mark Andreessen, I haven't been able to document this, but people have told me Mark Andreessen, maybe as a joke, suggested, let's change the name to JavaScript. <laughs> and it worked. Um, except that Sun claimed ownership of the trademark. Even though they had nothing to do with the language, they tried to kill the language. They said, we own the trademark. But we'll give you a license to use the trademark. And Netscape said, great. Uh, an exclusive license, only we can call it JavaScript, that's fine. Uh, uh, at Microsoft, uh, they've been watching this with some alarm, particularly when folks at Netscape were saying that uh, Netscape Navigator was going to destroy Microsoft. And so Microsoft, oh, we don't want to be destroyed. It, it turned out Netscape Navigator didn't destroy Microsoft. In fact, that the software that is going to destroy Microsoft is Windows Mobile. But, but <laughs> But I'm, I'm getting ahead of the story again. <laughs> so what Microsoft did was they decided they needed to copy the Netscape model in order to be competitive. So they reverse engineered the JavaScript engine um, and called it JScript. They, had to, they couldn't call it JavaScript because Sun owned the trademark and they weren't getting along very well with Sun at that time. So they called it JScript. Um, Netscape looked at that with alarm. Oh no, we're going to be em embraced and extended. So we need to make a standard out of this. So they went to W3C and said, OK, we've got a language for you to standardize. And W3C had been waiting for a long time for an opportunity to tell Netscape to go to hell. <laughs> so they told Netscape to go to hell. So Netscape went around to ISO and other places looking for a place where they could buy a standard. And they eventually ended up at the European Computer Manufacturers Association, which is sort of a long way to go for a California software company. But that's where they ended up. Um, and it turned out uh, Microsoft was on the committee that, uh, and a lot of other nice companies that were going to draft the standard. Um, 
one odd thing about the standards process at that time was Netscape said, we want a standard for this language, but we cannot call it JavaScript because only we can call it JavaScript. Um, so the committee tried to come up with a name for the language, couldn't. Uh, so in the end, they published it with the working title, which was ECMAScript, which is maybe the second worst name ever put on a programming language. Um, so what should we call the language? Uh, there's a lot of confusion. Some people still think that JavaScript, JScript, and ECMAScript are three different languages. That's not the case. It's three silly names for one silly language. Um, and JavaScript isn't actually an open name, which is surprising in that this is the language of the world's biggest open system. It's a trademark now of Oracle. Um, and we don't know what they're going to do with that. Um, so we probably should call it ECMAScript, except it's such an awful thing to call it. Um, um, but the ECMAScript standard has served us very well. So uh, the third edition was published in 1999. And that is the edition that you can find today in all web browsers. Um, last year, uh, ECMA approved the fifth edition, first change to the language in 10 years. Um, and it actually defines two languages now. There's the default language, which uh, it, it had to do in order to be compatible. And then there's a strict mode. Uh, ES5 strict is a uh, smaller language than the original. Um, and it's smaller in that it deletes some, unfortunately not all, but uh, removes or modifies some of the worst parts of the language. Um, so in the short term, what language do you use? Um, I recommend in the short term be working in the intersection of ES3 and ES5 strict. And in the long term, once we solve the IE6 problem, you want to be working in ES5 strict. Um, that will be the base of the language going forward. So if there's ever a sixth edition, it will be based on ES5 strict, not on ES5 default. So I recommend don't use ES5 default. Um, that's just not where the future is going to be. So since I discovered that the language had good parts, that sort of implies that it must have had bad parts. So why would anybody design a language with bad parts? How, how would that come about? And in my review of all the bad parts in the language, it mostly comes from three uh, causes. The first is legacy. Um, in copying the Java syntax, um, JavaScript also copied some bad things about Java. Um, so many of the worst features in JavaScript are actually things it inherited from Java, which it inherited from C, which it inherited from Fortran. So there's a, a long line of synage uh, which uh, affects us today. Um, there were some good intentions in the language that didn't quite work out. Um, things were added like semicolon insertion and uh, implied global variables with the intention of making the language easier to use for beginners. And in fact, it worked because it um, turns out if you have absolutely no idea of what you're doing in the language, you can still generally make things work. Um, unfortunately, those things work against professional programmers trying to do large, sophisticated programs. Um, so uh, there's uh, some trade-offs there that didn't work out well for us. But the biggest influence by far was haste. The language was designed, implemented, and shipped in way too little time. Um, most languages take years to develop. Um, for example, Smalltalk was eight years from Alan Kay's first prototype to Smalltalk 80 when it was uh, first made available to the public. That's a good time frame for a programming language because you want to go through it and, and test it and make sure that it works and refine it in order to, to make sure that it's meeting its goals. JavaScript was prepared in about as many days. Um, and it, it's amazing that he could get it done and designed and working in such an incredible short time, in about two weeks. And I challenge any design, language designer, it, it's sort of like a, a quick fire challenge. Um, that turns out not to be a good way to make software. Um, but that's how it was done, and we're now living with the consequences of that. So had Netscape been a better managed company, they might have taken a lot more time, maybe a couple extra weeks to, to kind of clean it up. Um, and we wouldn't be dealing with the, the bad parts that we have now, but, but we have. The good news is that for the most part, uh, the bad parts can be avoided. And if you avoid the bad parts, and if you work just with what's left over, the good parts, there's actually a brilliant language there. The, the features that were selected and the way that they were put together is astonishingly good. 
It's a language of amazing expressive power. JavaScript is a language that most people don't bother to learn before they use. You can't do that with any other language. Um, and, and you shouldn't want to, and you shouldn't do that with this language either. Programming is serious business, and you should have good knowledge about what you're doing. But most people feel that they ought to be able to program in this language without any knowledge at all. And, you, and it still works. And that's because the language has enormous expressive power. Um, and that's not by accident. There's a, some, actually some brilliant design in there. The problem with the bad parts isn't that they're useless. It's that they're dangerous. Um, and so I see a lot of wannabe ninjas out there who are going through the bad parts and going, oh, I found a, a new use for, for with, or, or another thing you can do with eval, or some other edge case. And it's like, stop doing that. Um, stop doing that. So, um, so um, this language is all about objects. Um, it's an object-oriented language. I'll try to demonstrate to you that it is more object-oriented than Java. For a long time, uh, a lot of the opinion about this language was that it's not object-oriented, it's object-based, it's deficient. Uh, it turns out it's actually a superior language. So in this language, an object is a dynamic collection of properties. This is quite different than in most of the other object-oriented languages, in which an object is an instance of a class, where a class has some state and behavior. Objects in this system are much more dynamic. Um, so it's a collection of properties. Each property has a key string which is unique within that object. So if you add two properties with the same name, the second one will replace the first one. The fundamental operations for objects are get, set, and delete. This might be a, a fairly familiar pattern. So there are two pieces of syntax for doing get. You uh, say object.name or object bracket um, an expression. And the two are completely uh, uh, symmetrical. So um, both will produce a key string which will then be used to go to the object to find a property and retrieve its value. Um, there's also set, which is the same thing, except it's in the L value part of a statement, which is generally the left side of an expression statement. Um, so you can assign a new property to an object or update a property of an object by simple assignment. And that's brilliant. That's really, really nice. Um, then there's a delete operator, which will remove a property from an object. This is used less frequently, generally not putting things in objects um, unless you need them to be there. Uh, but if you do need to take them out, you can. So there are two kinds of properties in the language, data properties and accessor properties. Um, so before I explain the difference, let me, um, let's look more deeply at what a property actually is. A property is a named collection of attributes. Um, so every uh, property has a value, um, which is the, the value that you assign from it, that you get back from it. Um, and it has uh, three Boolean flags writable, enumerable, and configurable, which control whether or not um, whether the thing is read-only or if it's enumerated by four in or if you can delete it or change it. Um, we just added in ES5 uh, two more um, attributes, get and set, which allow you to um, add functions which will be called on any attempt to get from the object or set to the object. Now, the first four of these things have always been in the language, but they were never exposed to the programmer. Uh, so they were always there kind of saying, hey, hey, but, but you couldn't use them, which was frustrating, because you, sometimes you like to make an object in which you can have a field in it which cannot be removed. we would like to add a method to a prototype and be confident that it's not going to show up in the 4N enumeration. So we fixed that in ES5. So now, finally, you can set these bits. Um, the way we do that is we've got um, some new functions. Uh, object defined property, object defined properties. Uh, the difference is that one takes a, uh, a single object and a key, the other takes an object of objects. Um, and they'll both define properties for you. Then you can get the property descriptors back with uh, object get own property descriptor and get own properties, which will return all of the properties of an object. And then an, another new thing, which is really nice, object.keys, which will, retrieve, which will return to you an array of all of the enumerable own keys of an object. And you can then take that array and hand it to um, uh, 
for each or, or the map function. So you can apply um, a, a set of functions to each property of an object. Really, really nice programming pattern. So let me show you an example of how this works. Um, you're all familiar with object literals. Object literals are one of the good parts of this language, where with just a little bit of syntax, you can very easily create a new object dynamically um, and specify it to be whatever you want. Other languages have initializers. This is a whole lot better than initializers. We never had a way in the language before of describing what object literals actually do, but now we can. In ES5, um, the second statement does the same thing as the first, but it's using the new uh, functions that are available to us. So we can see that what an object literal does is create a new object which inherits from object.prototype, and then we add a property to it which will have the value that we indicate and also set writable, configurable, and enumerable to true. So that's a really nice thing. And if it turns out, if you want to be defining this and set it up so that enumerable is false, now you know how to do it. You just use the long form. And maybe in a future edition, we'll have some syntax which makes it even easier. But for this revision, we didn't want to add any new syntax because we haven't solved the IE6 problem yet. And adding new syntax doesn't make your lives any better at all. And we'll talk more about that when we get to episode four. So here's an example of using an accessor property. The difference between an accessor property and a data property is an accessor property uses get and or set. So here I'm defining a property for my object called inch. Um, and when I try to get inch, my object dot inch, I will receive the result of dividing this dot millimeter by 25.4. And if I try to set it, I won't actually set this property. Instead, I will set millimeter to whatever value I pass times 25.4. So the result of this is I can have an object with two properties in it that are linked um, in, in an interesting constraint way so that I can set either the, uh, the millimeters or the inch and it will appear to, to fix the other one. So I can keep those two things in, in sync. There are a lot of really interesting patterns that can be done with these. There are even more evil patterns that can be done with this. Um, for example, one of the assumptions that you've always had in the language was you can go to an object and retrieve a property and there's no transfer of control. You're just getting some data. Now you're giving control over to a function, which you hope will give it back, but it might not. But it can also mutate the object while um, it's getting the thing. So something that used to be a read-only event is now potentially a mutating event, which could mutate this object or who knows what in the thing. So there are all sorts of really abusive patterns that can be made out of these getters and setters. Um, and so I recommend to all the ninjas, don't get stupid with this stuff, because it's going to be really, really easy to get stupid with this stuff. And I, I'm telling you, you can get stupid with this stuff, and you don't need to do it. So um, be smart with this. Use it sparingly. Well, one of the reasons we put it in is that um, you know, knowing about these hazards, um, the DOM uses this kind of interface. And one of the things we want to be able to do in the language is to wrap the DOM in order to correct it and tame it. And so we need to, to be able to create objects that work like the DOM does. Um, and so we need getters and setters in order to accomplish that. Um, I understand that that's a useful thing to do because we have to fix the DOM because it's so awful and, and that's a necessary step. But at the same time, we're now giving everybody the tools to create APIs that look exactly like the DOM. And the DOM is not a good model. You don't want to be making stuff that looks DOM-like. I, I think you'd do much better to stay with uh, a, a method, a methodic approach. Um, so this is in the language now. Be really, really careful with it. Um, the most controversial feature of the language is the way it does inheritance, um, which is radically different than virtually all other modern languages. Uh, most languages use classes. I call them classical languages. JavaScript does not. JavaScript is class-free. It uses prototypes. Um, um, and for, so for people who are classically trained who look at the language, they go, well, this is deficient. You don't have classes. How can you get anything done? How can you have any confidence that the structure of your program is going to work? Um, and, and they never get past that. But it turns out. Um, 
so classes as we currently understand them were first formulated in 1967 in Simula. Um, the prototypal school was developed about 20 years later at Xerox Park by people who had intimate knowledge of Smalltalk, which was the first uh, modern or first popular, semi-popular object-oriented programming language. Um, so the changes that they made were not made in ignorance. Uh, it was very well informed, uh, changing, simplifying, advancing the programming model. And uh, what they did was they created, a, in my view, a vast improvement over the model that had come before. Um, so it's possible, um, uh, one demonstration of uh, the greater power of the new thing is that, well, first off, code is smaller. If, you, if you're writing to the prototypal model and you're doing it correctly, your programs are a lot smaller. Uh, for one thing, you're, uh, you take out a lot of the silly redundancy, like um, I'm creating a variable of this type named that type, initialized with new that type. You know, you, you, saying everything three times. You, you tend not to do that in, in a prototypal language. Um, but more than that, you can simulate the classical language in the prototypal language. You can't do the other. Java is not powerful enough that you can write in a JavaScript style in Java. It's just not good enough. Um, JavaScript is. You can do it the other way around because it's the more powerful of the models. Um, it, it's unfortunate that they're called prototypes because we understand prototypes to mean so many other things. For example, in programming languages, uh, they can mean uh, the signature of a function. They can also mean um, a sample program that you intend to throw away. Um, and when we talk about prototypes here, we don't mean either of those things. We're talking about another concept. So there's some overloading and confusion of terms. Um, even so, working with prototypes is really easy. You make an object that you like, and you make it just by creating an object literal or using assignment the, the way we showed before. It's really easy to make an object in this language and have it contain anything you want. And then you can make new instances uh, with no effort by calling object.create, which inherit from that object. And then you can customize those objects and make them be exactly what you want. Um, it's really easy. You don't have to do any, you don't have to build a taxonomy. You don't have to classify your system. Classification turns out to be really, really hard. We don't know how to train people to do it. It's sort of an intuitive thing. Generally, you're classifying a system you don't fully understand. And the likelihood that you're going to get it right is virtually zero, which means in the end you're going to have a lot of cruft or you're going to have to do a lot of refactoring. In the prototypal school, it just doesn't happen because you don't have to do that classification. Um, so it's a significantly easier programming model. Um, and you can scale up and, and make uh, applications of amazing uh, complexity and sophistication. You don't need classes, it turns out. Um, so this model of programming is sometimes called delegation, where you'll make an object um, and it can delegate to another object. So anything it doesn't know how to do, that guy will do it for me. Um, that turns out to be really easy. This is sometimes also called differential inheritance, in which you make an object and you add stuff to it only uh, to make it different from the object that it inherits from. You, it only contains the differences. Um, and, and that's also a really nice way to think about object composition. Um, objects, ha um, in order to accomplish this, the way JavaScript does this, is objects have a prototype attribute. Uh, this is not a, a prototype property. This is an attribute of the object. We've already talked about attributes of the properties. Objects also have attributes. Um, the uh, prototype property can be an object or a, a reference to an object, or it can be null, saying that um, this object does not inherit from anything. Um, we have a, a new method now, um, object.create, which allows us to make a new object which inherits from an existing object. And at the same time, we can also ask it to copy material from existing objects into that one as well. So we now um, have a way of doing object copying in the language, something we never had before. And then you can get at the prototype uh, by using object.getprototype of. We added this specifically for Kaha, because in doing uh, DOM taming, they sometimes needed to be able to chase down the content of objects in order to, to figure out what they were. We're hoping that people do not use this method. You, you don't need to do it. Generally, if you're, you're programming correctly, you don't care about the heritage of a language. You don't want to ask, 
what are you an instance of? Because you don't care. You just want to know, do you have the function that I need in order to get this done? And if yes, I'm going to call you. Um, and if you don't have it, then we'll throw an exception because that's the right thing to do. Um, but you, you shouldn't care about where an object came from. You shouldn't care about what it inherits from. You just care about what it can do. Um, so JavaScript itself was confused about its prototypal nature. Um, so originally, it didn't have object.create. Instead, it had the new operator, uh, which modified the way invocation worked. And if you were to express um, the new operator as a new function, this is what it actually does. Um, it calls object.create on the prototype property of your function, makes a new object that inherits from that. Um, and then it calls your function, binding the new object to that and passing along whatever, whatever arguments you gave it. And then it takes the result, and if the result is an object, then it returns that object. And if it's not an object, then uh, it returns the object that you made. Um, so uh, it, it was trying to look classical um, so that the Java kids would look at it and go, yeah, OK, this isn't too different. Um, but it, it doesn't look classical at all, particularly when you look at how you put methods into a class or a pseudo class, where you go to func dot prototype and then start sticking stuff on it. It's really ugly. And then if you want to inherit from something, it's even worse. Um, so uh, I don't use new anymore. I, I don't, don't need it. I'm thinking prototypally now. And when I'm thinking prototypally, I can do everything I want to do with object.create. So I, I see this now as just a vestige, don't need any more. Also, there's a hazard with new, that if you design a constructor that's supposed to be used with new, and either you or one of your users forgets to put the new prefix on it, instead of initializing a new object, your constructor is going to be clobbering the global object, uh, damaging global variables, and not doing useful work at all. And there's no compile time warning and no runtime warning of that. Uh, that's a feature I don't need to use. So, JavaScript's objects are really nice in that um, they're the union of objects and hash tables of general collections. I, and doing all of that at once is just amazingly nice. But it, it got a few things wrong. So here I've got a bump count uh, function. Um, say I take a regular expression, break a text into a bunch of words, and then I want to count how many occurrences there are of this word. I would take each, call this function for each word and my list and then look at the object that results, and that'll tell me what the frequencies are. Except that if the word constructor is in the text, then this function is going to fail for that word. And the reason is the object already contained a property that inherited called constructor, which was a pointer to the object function. Um, so it's like, man, so um, when I pull out uh, the word count uh, for that word, it's going to come back truthy because it's a function. And I'll try to add one to the function, and that doesn't work. So I'll, I'll change it to, uh, under, or to nan, which is stupid. And then I can't count anymore because it'll always be nan. So the way you have to write this if you want it to work for, for all inputs is I have to ask, are you a number? I have to actually ask what the type of the thing is. Because if it's a function, then I want to go ahead and set it to one. Um, and, and then it'll do the right thing. So this is a really easy bug to make, a really easy trap. And it's something that's impossible to test for, because chapter 16 of the ECMAScript standard says that a browser maker can add new properties to any prototype. Um, so in doing that, I can't predict all of the words that might be on there. So I couldn't special case for, for constructor. Uh, there, there are other examples of this. Um, this is a really common one. Uh, you're using for in to go through all the properties of an object, but it turns out you also start cycling through um, some of the inherited methods because it can pull up everything that's in the prototype chain, and that has caused programs to break. So the recommended practice is to call um, the object's has own property method in order to filter the results to avoid um, having that kind of exposure. Except that fails if uh, the object contains something called has own property, because that property will prevent us from being able to call the method that we want to get at. So if we want to write this in a resilient way, we have to write if object.prototype.hasOwnProperty.call 
of object.name, which is awful. Uh, you shouldn't have to do that, but, but you do. I mean, this is required for completely correct writing in the language. So there are all these weird edge cases that, that can really screw you up. Fortunately, we have solutions to these in ES5. Um, first off, um, object.create can now take null as a parameter, which means I'm going to make an object which inherits nothing. So it'll be a completely pristine object. Anything you read from it will be an own property. It will have nothing in it that you didn't put in it. Um, so that'll be very nice. Um, we also have the enumerable attribute exposed to you now. So um, you can now, when you're adding your prototypes to, a, to, um, to your class or to your uh, adding functions to your prototype, you can now say, and I do not want these things enumerated. And that will mean that they'll never show up in 4 and they'll never show up in, in the keys. And then, and then last, we've got object.keys, which will only give you the own properties, uh, the own uh, enumerable properties. It will not give you inherited properties. And then again, you can hand that to um, the map method and do amazing things with that. Um, one of the uh, downsides is that keys must be strings. Um, it would be nice if keys could be any value, but they're not. Uh, so that what the system does is get or set will take whatever key you provide, force it to be a string. So if, if you pass it a number, it'll turn it into a string. If you pass it an array, it'll turn it into to bracket object object bracket, which is not useful at all. There are some applications where it would be really useful if we could have used keys. One example would be in making sealers and unsealers. Um, suppose I want to be able to uh, take a, a value and sort of encode it in a way and give it to a third party and then allow them to give it to someone else. And the, the guy in the middle cannot get at the value or tamper with it. But if he gives it to someone else, they'll be able to, to reclaim the, the real value. It'd be trivial to write this with an object if I had objects as keys, but I can't. So I can simulate that by having a pair of arrays. Um, and then at the critical time, I use index of on the array to search through it in order to find which value that I want. Um, so it's possible to work around that in the language, but it's going to slow you down if the number of things you're cycling over is going to be very large. Um, another uh, attribute that objects have is an extensible bit. And this is another thing that's new in um, ES5. So you can find out if an object is extensible by calling is extensible. Um, and if you call prevent extensions, it turns the bit off. And it can then never be turned back on again. When you turn that bit off, it means the object is full. You cannot add any new properties to it. If you try to add any more to it, you'll get an exception. Um, then going even further, um, seal does the same thing. But it also goes through all of the objects and turns off are all of the, the properties and turns off all of their um, uh, uh, configurable bits so that they can't be deleted or changed from data to uh, accessor or back. Then finally, there's object.freeze. And that does the same thing, but it also sets everything to read only, turns off everybody's writable bits. So we now have immutable objects. It turns out we've always had immutable objects in the language. We just didn't know it. Uh, uh, numbers and strings and booleans are immutable objects. Uh, the system could make them, but you couldn't. But now you can. You can make your own immutable objects now. Um, so we have lots of types in the language. And they're all uh, based on objects. Everything in the system uh, inherits from objects, including numbers, booleans, and everything. So uh, let's look at some of these. Uh, starting with number. Number is one of the fundamental things in programming languages. This is the, the first. That's why we call them computers, that, that they used to compute. So numbers are important. Um, in most programming languages, you get a lot of numbers. There are lots of number types. Uh, there are integers of, of various sizes. You've got uh, bytes or chars, short ints, ints, long ints, double long ints. And you've got floating point of several sizes and maybe others. JavaScript only has one, and, and it turns out to be right. Uh, the reason C and, and all the languages that grew up from it have so many types was in the old days, you'll remember, um, CPUs were slow. And so working on a small number was faster than working on a larger number. And memory was small and expensive. So making numbers small meant you could fit more numbers in memory. But today, memory is really big. Um, and you know, the, the 
uh, size taken up by your variables is in the noise compared to all the other stuff that you're loading into your browser. Um, so make them all big. Make them all the biggest size. So in JavaScript, that's 64 bits. Avoiding all of the intermediate and smaller sizes means that we can avoid a large class of programming errors that comes from picking the wrong size. Because if you put something in a byte and it's bigger than a byte, it's going to wrap around or overflow and you're going to get the wrong value. That kind of error never happens in JavaScript. Um, it, was all, it was done specifically to make the language easier for beginners so that they wouldn't have to know about all these different number types and know which one to use. There's just one type, and that's brilliant. It means uh, there's no mixed mode, there's no number conversions. It's simple, uh, and, and that's good for us. It's based on a standard IEEE 754, what Java calls double. What a stupid thing to call a number type, but they call it double, going back to Fortran double precision. You know, it seems like once something stupid gets in, it takes a long, long time to get it out. Um, we've got number literals. Um, these are all the same number. These are all equivalent to 1,024 um, using scientific notation and, and, and decimal points. So one of the problems with numbers in all programming languages, in, in all computer applications, is that the associative law does not hold. And that's because um, computer numbers are necessarily finite, and real numbers are not. Um, they can be uh, irrational, they can be transcendental, they cannot be accurately represented um, in, in computer memory. So we can approximate them pretty well, and for the most part it works, but it means that for some values, um, A plus B plus C will not be equal to A plus B plus C, and, and you have to be aware of that. Fortunately, integers work. So if you're working in integers that are smaller than nine quadrillion, it's gonna work. So you don't need to worry about those. Um, when, once you get to nine quadrillion, then things get a little weird. For example, if you take that number and add one to it, you get the same number. And that looks crazy, crazy. How could anybody do that intentionally? That x plus one equals x. But in, in fact, it does. There's a, a huge class of values for which that is true. You just need to be aware of that. So the order of operations um, in, in your numbers turns out to be critical. Um, it, it's a particular problem with uh, decimal fractions. Because of the binary floating point standard that we're using, which virtually all programming languages in the last 20 years use the same thing, this does not hold. So if A, B, and C are 0 0.1, 0 0.2, plus 0.3, they do not associate. We get a different answer if we add them in one direction than the other. Um, reason for this, well, this is a, a general problem in computer arithmetic, but it's a spe specific problem with decimal numbers. Because we're using binary floating point, we cannot accurately represent decimal numbers, which is a problem because we live on a planet that's mostly on the decimal system. Um, and the quantities that we most often deal with that look like this are money. And people have a rec reasonable expectation that when you're adding up their money, you're going to come up with the right result. And you don't. The most reported bug in the Mozilla database is a variation on that. People have found every permutation of a set of decimal numbers where you add them together and you get the wrong answer. Um, and you do. Um, so what you need to be able to do in this case is turn it into integers. So if you're dealing with, with um, dollars, you multiply them by 100, turn them into cents, and then do the work. Um, you, you, want to be sure you have less than four quadrillion cents. Um, but the national budget still is smaller than that. Um, so most applications are probably going to be fine. Um, I, I, I got an uh, a email from somebody once who um, has an astrology site. And he was shocked at this and going, oh no, am I, are my forecasts wrong? I think it's probably, I don't want to alarm anybody, it's probably good enough for astrology. <laughs> um, so numbers are objects in this language, so as all objects do, they've got methods. Most of the methods are for changing numbers into strings, um, and then there's one which is used by the system itself to extract values from it, you know, so the binary operators can use value of in order to know uh, how to get a something that they could add or subtract. 
um, all numbers inherit from number.prototype. So it turns out if you want to extend, or not extend, augment object or number.prototype, add your own methods to it, you can. Um, so in this case, I want to add a trunk method to a number. So I can call any number, truncate it, which will remove the fractional part of it and leave just the integer. Um, it's important, though, uh, because uh, number.prototype and all of the prototypes are global structures available to all programs that are running on the same page, uh, you don't want to do this carelessly. Um, so you should at least, before you do it, make sure that there isn't something else already there, because some future version of the language might intend to do that, and you don't want to be replacing your slow version with the native faster version. You also might be competing with multiple libraries that are trying to do the same thing. So generally, um, applications should not be extending the fundamental prototypes, but AJAX libraries, yeah, there, there's a good reason to be doing that. Um, this uh, facility was added to the language intentionally because the language was shut, uh, shipped to market so quickly. Uh, there was uh, a, a correct expectation that there were going to be some problems, and they wanted to make it possible to fix the language in the field. Um, and so this allows us to do that. So if, if someone discovers that there's a browser incompatibility in, in the way some of these methods work, or if there's one browser that is lacking a method that everybody else has, an AJAX library can fix that. And, and that turns out to be a, a really useful thing. Um, numbers are first class objects, which means a number of things. First, that a number can be stored in a variable, a number can be passed as a parameter, a number can be returned as a function, these are all true for Java also, except Java doesn't have functions, but it has methods, which are almost as good. Um, and a number can be stored in an object, and this is something that Java cannot do. A, a Java int cannot be put into a hash table, um, but they can here, um, because they're already objects. So you don't have to box them or wrap them in order to, to put them into a container. Uh, they already work well. Um, there is a, a math object. This was another bit of badness that was inherited from Java. Java put a, a lot of the elementary functions into a separate object with the idea that in some configurations, um, you know, nobody ever uses these functions anyway, so we'll just uh, throw it out. Except it turns out there's some essential stuff in here, like floor, which is the thing you have to use to turn a, a real number into an integer. That turns out to be essential. You can't jettison that. So there will always be a math function. So these things should have been methods of number, uh, but they're not. So they're in this other space. Um, math also contains some constants, and, and you can use those. So for example, here you could write a, a log2 function by using uh, log2e and the log function, put them together, and you get log2. Um, one last bit of nastiness. This is something that we get from the IEEE standard, and this is in all other languages. There's a special number called NAN, which stands for not a number. So even though it says it's not a number, it is a number. But it's the number which isn't any real value. It can be the result of undefined or erroneous operations. For example, if you divide 0 by 0, the result is NAN. And it is toxic. So if you have uh, an arithmetic operation and NAN is an input to that, NAN will be an output as well. So um, you don't get exceptions thrown when you're doing bad math. You just get bad values, which can be uh, troubling sometimes because you could go through a whole bunch of computation at the end. The answer is NAN, and you don't know why. There's no indication as to when the value got bad, and, and so you really have to trace through the whole thing to, to figure it out. Um, the, the thing that I hate about NAN, I mean, that other stuff is all good. This is really bad. NAN is not equal to NAN. <laughs> Worse than that, NAN not equal to NAN is true. <laughs> this is appalling. This makes me angry. Like, what were they thinking? And how did this become a standard and, and you know, it's polluting our language? This is one of the bad parts. I don't think Brendan... Uh, is at fault on this one. Just the standard is bad. But once standards go bad, it's bad for everybody. OK, Boolean. Uh, Boolean is a type named after uh, British mathematician uh, George Boole. 
Um, you'll be glad to know there are exactly two Boolean values in the language, true and false. So we got that right. <laughs> now, string. Ever wonder why we call them strings? I mean, they don't look like strings. How, does that make any sense? You want to know why we call them strings? Nobody knows. <laughs> Uh, as far as I can tell, the first use of string to mean a data type in a programming language, which is a sequence of characters, was the Algol 60 report, which was uh, probably the best design by committee in the history of programming languages, maybe the only successful design by committee in the history of programming languages, uh, hugely influential on everything that came after, including the use of string. But they didn't explain in the report why they called it string. and there doesn't appear to be a good reason for it. It probably should have been called text, or possibly Hollerith, you know, after Herman Hollerith, sort of the same way that we named Booleans after Bool. It makes more sense than string, but that's what we call them. We got strings. So strings are great. Um, in this language, a string is a sequence of zero or more 16-bit Unicode characters um, in the sense of UCS2, which isn't quite the same thing as UTF-16. And the difference is in the surrogate pairs. So when Unicode was originally designed, um, the intention was 16-bit uh, characters. That's about 65,000 characters. With the unification of Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, that ought to be enough to represent all of the characters used in all the languages in the world. But it turned out they didn't quite fit. And there are a lot of other languages which are dead or uh, made up or special characters, you know, Klingonese and other things that people want to, want to be able to do online that are not going to fit in the, in the base character set. So um, they reserved 2,000 characters within the 64,000 and called them surrogate pairs. So there's 1,000 of one kind and 1,000 of another. And if you take those and put them together, that is a code space of about a million. And so there are a million extended characters potentially in Unicode. But JavaScript was designed before Unicode had that explosive growth. And so JavaScript still thinks it's a 16-bit character set. Um, JavaScript tolerates the surrogate characters, but has no knowledge of them. So if you ask, um, if you have a string containing one surrogate character, JavaScript thinks it's a string with two characters in it. Um, so the counts will be wrong. You've got to be really careful when you do your substring operations, because you don't want to split those things. Otherwise, um, it, everything works. Unlike many other programming languages, there's no separate character type. So there's no type char, there's no type character. So if you want to talk about an individual character, it's just a short string. Um, strings are immutable, in, in the sense that we talked about before, where they're frozen. Um, similar strings are equal. Uh, this is something that Java got wrong. JavaScript got it right, because JavaScript's the better language. It, and um, we can have string literals written with either single quotes or double quotes. They both work exactly the same way with backslash escapement within it. Um, something new in ES5 is we can now have multi-line string literals. So if you have a really long string and you want to split it over multiple lines, you can do that. Um, so what you do is you put a backslash at the end of the line, and that says that the line feed that comes after it should be ignored. Um, but there's a hazard. Um, one of these statements does the correct thing, and the other produces a syntax error. Can anybody spot the problem? Yeah, the problem is that there's a space after the backslash. <laughs> it's obvious when it's pointed out. Um, and that's why I recommend you don't use this. Um, programming is hard enough. You don't want to be using idioms which are difficult to distinguish from bugs. You want to be writing things which are hopefully clearly right. And it's hard to be clearly right uh, with this construction. Um, we have some services for creating, for converting numbers into strings. Uh, you can either use the toString method, which is on all numbers, or you can use the string function passing it a, a value. Um, these will generally do the same thing, except for uh, things that do not have a toString method, such as null and undefined. The second one will work and turn it into a name. Uh, the first one will throw an exception. 
then we sometimes you want to convert in a string into a number, and there are a number of ways to do that. You can use the number function, or you can use the uh, plus prefix operator, which does the same thing but is a lot smaller, and so I, I like that much better. Um, there's also the parse int function. Uh, parse int is a little bit strange. Um, it will um, look at each of the characters in a string and stop when it finds a character which is not a digit. And then it will return to you uh, the number based on the digits that it found and not tell you about the other stuff that it skipped. Um, this is particularly a problem when um, you're parsing dates and times, things which might have a leading zero in them. Like uh, right now it's uh, 07 o'clock. So um, what parse int will do is when it sees the first zero, it assumes, oh, we're in base eight, actually, naturally. Um, so then it sees the eight. Eight is not a base eight digit, so it stops, and so the result is zero. Really common error. Um, and so uh, the way to avoid that uh, is to pass a radix. So you can tell it what base it's in and say, I don't care if you see a zero, this is base 10, so don't screw this up. Um, and that'll work. So uh, I recommend always include uh, the radix when you're using parseint. So uh, strings are objects. Objects can have properties. One of the properties of the string is its length, and it will tell you the number of 16-bit characters in the string. Um, strings have a whole lot of methods. There's a, a really nice set of methods. Um, you can set things to uppercase and lowercase. You can split out substrings. You can search and replace and lots of good stuff. Uh, one new thing that we have in the language now is trim. Trim was added in ES5. Should have been there in ES1, but it somehow didn't make it in until now. Um, what trim does is it removes all the extra white space on the ends of a string, so that if the user is sloppy cutting and pasting into a field, you can just clean that, all that up and get just the data value that you want, which is really important. Um, now, older browsers don't have that. ES5 will go into the field. We don't know when yet. None of the browser makers have committed to a date. Um, it's likely that it's ES5 will be in IE9, but Microsoft hasn't announced when it's going to be, although they have announced that it's going to be number nine. So we're, we're pretty confident of that. Um, parts of ES5 are already in the field. For example, uh, ES5 has JSON support in it, and that's already in IE8, and it's already in Firefox. Um, so uh, the minority browsers are likely to, to catch up pretty quickly, but again, we don't know when they're going to do this. So if you want to be using Trim, which is a really useful thing to be using, and you're on a browser that doesn't have it yet, then you can fix it, like I talked about before. So one of the advantages of being able to modify the prototype of, in this case, uh, string.prototype, is so that we can correct it, so that an AJAX library could normalize the browser so that the programmer doesn't have to care which version of the browser he's on. Um, so here, um, uh, we're, we're setting string.prototype.trim string to a function which will call the replace method of the string, replacing some stuff with some other stuff, and that will take off the spaces. And again, very, very important, we have the preamble, uh, which will cause this to do nothing if there is already a trim function there, uh, because there's a good chance that a future version of the browser will actually have one. We don't want to replace the browser's fast version with this slow, potentially buggy version. Um, so we want to be very careful in, in, in adding those. Um, another useful thing would be to have a supplant method. Here I've got some, uh, I want to do some client-side HTML generation, and I've got a template, and I've got a data structure containing some values, and I'd like to do a replacement of the names in there with the values. And this, you know, you know just calling template.supplant, passing it the data, and I get back the thing which is obviously what you want. And go, wow, this is really neat. Unfortunately, this didn't get into ES5. Um, but again, it's really easy to do. So, you know, if, if you're an Ajax library maker, you can just go ahead and add that, and then all of your users will be able to, to do this very nice thing. Uh, we have arrays in this language. Arrays are very common in, in all programming languages. An array is a contiguous sequence of memory divided into equal sized slots and then you give it an index number and that you compute which slot you're in and get the value back. It's the fastest of all data uh, structures. Really useful thing. Turns out JavaScript doesn't have anything like that. Um, 
what JavaScript has is objects, and um, it, it uses its objects to simulate an array. So arrays inherit from object, everything inherits from objects. So the way arrays work is we take the index, turn it into a number, stick it in an object, okay, it does its hash operation, figures out what bucket to put it in, creates a property, all of that overhead. Um, so every time you access a field in the object, we're having to do a hash lookup. So the, the speed advantages that you'd like to have in array are not present. Um, now, it turns out this is really efficient for sparse arrays, but it turns out we never use sparse arrays. That's just not part of something that we see in web applications. Our, our arrays are always dense, um, so they're really inefficient. Um, they do provide one uh, advantage to the programmer. That is, there's no need to define a length on an array because they don't actually have a length. So uh, when you create a, an array, you're not setting aside a, a bucket of memory. It's an object, and it can grow dynamically as it needs to. So there's no need to dimension it. So that turns out to be really nice. Um, so arrays, um, unlike objects, have a length property. And it's a, an accessor property, which um, changes. Um, it, it's always one larger than the highest integer subscript that's stored in the array. That's not the same as the actual length of the array. It's not the number of members of the array. It's one more than the last property in the array. Uh, which, if it's a dense array, they'll be the same. But if it's sparse, uh, they could be very, very different. Um, and that's useful because it allows us to use a conventional for loop to go through all the members of an array in sequence. I recommend you not use for in with arrays because for in does not guarantee what order it's going to bring the items out. And generally, when you're working with an array, you want to do it in order. Um, and for in will not do it in order. Now, someday, um, browser makers may put real arrays into the language and, and try to make it faster. The current uh, specification doesn't uh, doesn't pro prohibit it, so uh, it, it could happen eventually. Become standard equipment. Um, when that happens, um, uh, one of the reasons why for in doesn't uh, guarantee any particular ordering is because we couldn't figure out how to specify what the ordering should be and still allow for these new kind of arrays to be added to the language. Um, so if your program depends on for in producing keys in a particular sequence, your program is in error. And it could break in some future version of the language. So uh, don't do that. Uh, we have a very nice array literal notation, which is very similar to the object literal notation, except we're using square brackets. So here I'm going to uh, make an array, and it will contain three things, oats, peas, and beans. Um, then I can add a new thing to the array. Or right now, my list uh, dot length is three. Um, zero, one, and two, length being one bigger than the last index. So my list sub, uh, my list dot length is my list dot three, so I'm gonna assign barley to the third slot now length is four. So um, in some languages, this would cause you an array bounds error because we're adding something beyond the end of the array. Arrays in this language don't have bounds because they're not really arrays, they're objects. And so that's not a problem. They manage that really well. Uh, you don't use the dot notation with arrays because there's no, because generally we're talking about numbered things. And numbers look like decimal points. So you can't say my array dot one because uh, the compiler gets confused. Um, so you have to use the subscript notation. Now, arrays have methods, and you can use dot to get at the methods. And there are a lot of methods. Um, and in ES5, we just added a bunch of them, um, uh, particularly for each and map, which are really nice, because you pass uh, those functions uh, a function, and that function will then be called for each element of the array. And that's a really expressive pattern for, for getting a lot of work done with a small amount of code. The particular way that we're doing it is suboptimal. It turned out um, Firefox put these methods in. I don't think they designed the API quite right, um, but we liked most of what they were doing, and we couldn't change it because there are Firefox users who were dependent on um, the things that uh, Mozilla got wrong. Um, so 
Now it's wrong for all of you too. Um, there's a sorting method, um, and there's some surprising behavior here. So I'm, I'm passing sort, um, or I'm going to sort an array of numbers, and it turned out it should have had no work to do because I gave them in the right order. Uh, but they come out in this apparently random order. Can anyone guess what went wrong? Yeah, it, it evaluated each of those numbers as though they were strings in order to figure out how to place them. So 1, 5 comes before 2, 3, and so you got that. Fortunately, sort allows you to pass in your own comparison function, which will get past pairs of values, and then you return a value based on which one you think should come first. Um, it, it, it's kind of shocking that it, by default, cannot sort simple numbers. Um, you can delete things from an array, um, but using the delete operator doesn't do what you want because it leaves a hole. So instead, you have to use the array splice method, which uh, does something different. So let, let me show you an example. Um, here I've got my array, and I want to delete element number one, okay, which would be the B. So I, I say delete my array sub one. What that did was it removed one, the, the one property, but left the two and three properties just where they were. So now it appears that I have an undefined spot or a hole in the array. Uh, what you'd probably want is to, to fill it up, you know, to move them over. And the way you have to do that is change the C's key from 2 to 1 and change the B's key from 3 to 2. And the splice method does that. And as you might imagine, it's not fast because it has to go through and rehash everything and it, it's a, a slow process, but it does allow you to clean up the hole. So because arrays and objects are, are almost the same in this language, uh, some people get confused about when to use which. Um, and sometimes it doesn't matter, but sometimes it matters a lot. And so it's best to always do it the right way. So the right way is use objects when the names are arbitrary strings and use arrays when the names are sequential integers. Don't be confused by the term associative array. In this language, object is the associative array. We have a date uh, function, um, and it was based on Java's date class, which was not Y2K ready, even though Java came to market in 95. Maybe they weren't expecting it was going <laughs> to last. I don't know. Fortunately, that's been fixed. Um, so we're now Y2K compliant in JavaScript. Um, and we have regular expressions. Now, I don't know if you can read that. That is a regular expression which matches regular expressions. At least that's what I'm claiming. I, I, I wrote that regular expression, and now even I'm not confident that's what it does. <laughs> regular expressions are this awful notation. that, for, for simple things, they're a very effective way of matching text and finding patterns, and, and they're brilliant for that. But for complicated stuff, it, it does not scale well. Um, and you get things which are virtually impossible to read that all have to be on one line with no white space or commentary inserted into it. It's all got to be smushed together. And parsing that and figuring out, does that match what I think it matches? Uh, it, they're virtually impossible to test. They're impossible to read. Um, it, what really scares me is a lot of people use them for input validation. How can you have any confidence that it's accepting and rejecting the things that you think it's supposed to accept and reject? But they're popular, and that's the important thing. And so, so we've got them. Um, so if you're going to use them, my advice is, if it's more than two inches, uh, rethink it. You, you probably want to be using a different tool. Um, the best feature in the language, the good parts, the very best parts, are functions. And we'll talk about them next time. Uh, uh, so that, that's all the objects. So all the values in this language are objects with two exceptions, null and undefined. We've got two bottom values that are not nothing. They've got uh, no methods. Uh, they're just their own things. So we have null. Null is the value you give something when you don't have anything to, else to say about it. Uh, sometimes used as terminators on lists. Sometimes they're used as empty values or none of the above values or something like that. You use null to indicate nothing. And then undefined is the value that's not even that. Undefined is the default value for variables and parameters. 
So if you have a variable and you declare it and you don't initialize it, it's already initialized, it's undefined, which is a little confusing because in the act of defining it, you initialize it to undefined. Um, so it's defined and undefined at the same time. Maybe not the best name for that value, but that's what it's called. Um, it's also the value of missing uh, members in objects. So if you fetch, if you get a, a, a property from an object, and if the object didn't have that property, and if none of the objects that it inherits from has that property either, then it doesn't throw an exception. You don't get a compile time warning, nothing like that. It just returns the undefined value, which is actually very nice. It's a very nice way to query an object, to reflect upon an object, to find out what it, what it has in it. Um, there's a type of operator in the language which can tell you what the type of something is. So if, if, uh, since any variable can contain anything of any of the types that we've talked about, sometimes you need to know which kind is it. You know, I'm looking for a number. Is it a number? Um, so you can use the type of operator. So if you have a number, it'll return the string number. And you go, great, I know what you are now. If you pass it in an array, um, it says it's an object, which um, isn't completely wrong because arrays inherit from object, but it's not helpful because sometimes you want to know, is it an array or is it an object? Type of doesn't help at all with that. Even worse is uh, if the value is null. It says it's an object. This is wrong. This is just wrong. This was an error in the very first version of JavaScript. It was copied by Microsoft in JScript. Uh, they did an incredibly good job of reverse engineering Netscape's work. <laughs> it's the most uh, faithful copy Microsoft has ever made of anything, probably the best, most disciplined piece of engineering they've ever accomplished. The reason we're here talking about this language tonight is because Microsoft did such a good job of finding and replicating all of the errors that were in the original JavaScript engine. When they got to ECMA, Microsoft and said, those errors are staying in the standard. <laughs> because if we were to fix that, we could break a program. And at Microsoft, we could never tolerate that. <laughs> we, we tried really hard uh, uh, to fix this in ES5, and we just couldn't. There are too many programs that are dependent on this really bad behavior. Um, so yeah, we've just stuck with it. So, if, if you have a value and you need to know, is it null or is it an object, there's not a simple test for that, um, and so, which is unfortunate. You have to test both its objectness and then look to see if it's truthy. Um, in a moment, I'll tell you what truthiness is. So, uh, fortunately, in ES5, we have now corrected the uh, how do you know if something's an array problem. We have a new function called array.isArray, and if you pass it an array, it returns true. And if you pass it anything else, it returns false, which is useful. Uh, again, it's not in all of the other browsers. It's only in ES5, and that's not available yet. But if you're uh, a uh, by Ajax library, you have the option of, again, conditionally defining this so that people can start taking advantage of it today. And their programs will only get uh, faster and more reliable in the future. So um, these values are considered falsy. False, null, undefined, the empty string, the number zero, and nan. These are the falsy values. All other values in the language are truthy, um, including all objects, including empty objects and empty arrays. Um, the string zero, because it's not an empty string, and the string false, even though it looks like false, it's truthy because it's a non-empty string. Uh, truthy means that if you put it in the control part of an if statement, you'll take the, the then branch. And falsy means if you put it in the control part of an if statement, you'll take the else branch. All right? Um, this language is loosely typed. Any of the types that we've been talking about can be stored in any variable, can be passed as a parameter to any function, the language is not untyped. It, it, it's very much aware of what the types are and how they work. But it's loosely typed, and that allows any of these types to be stored in any, any location. Um, there are other languages which tend to be much more strict about that. But this language is very loose. Uh, there are some advantages and disadvantages of that. Um, objects can be passed as arguments to functions, and they can be returned from functions. Objects can be passed by reference. Uh, they are not passed by value, meaning that objects are, 
almost never copied. If I pass an object to a function, it gets a reference or a pointer to that function. Um, the equality operator um, compares object references, not values. So if you have two objects that look the same, that contain the same properties um, and the same values, but are not the same object, then they will be found to be not equal. Uh, syntactically, JavaScript is clearly a member of the C family of programming languages. It's got the curly braces and all of that stuff. It differs from C mainly in its type system, which allows functions to be values. Um, we have identifiers in the language, which we use for variable names, function names, property names, um, uh, and labels. Um, they start with a letter or an underbar or a dollar sign followed by zero or more letters, digits, underbars, or dollar signs. By convention, all variables, parameters, uh, uh, members, and uh, properties, function names should all start with lowercase. The exception is functions that are intended to be used as constructors, and those should start with uppercase. And the reason for that is earlier I talked about the problem with uh, the new operator. And if you forget to use new on a constructor, bad, bad things happen, and there's no warning in the system. So the only protection we have against that is to very strongly enforce the convention that constructor functions that require new always have an uppercase character and nothing else does. And only then do we have any hope of getting our programs right. Um, initial underbar uh, should be reserved for machines and implementations so that uh, if a browser needs its own special secret properties, uh, they'll have an, an underbar prefix on them. Um, a lot of people use them anyway because they think they look cool or something. I, I don't recommend that. Um, dollar sign was added to the language specifically for use by code generators and macro processors. So if you have machines writing code and the machines need to be able to be confident that the variables that they create will not conflict with variables that the humans are going to create, um, to distinguish them will allow the machines to use dollar sign. Well, uh, some of the ninjas found out about that and go, oh, dollar sign, I can, I, I can use dollar sign as a, as a function name. And so they're out there doing that. And it looks stupid. I mean, look at a program with dollar sign. <laughs> Calling dollar sign, how does that make any sense? And some of them have two or three dollar signs. It's like, uh, uh, so everybody ignored the convention. The standard says you shouldn't do that. Everybody did it anyway, because you know, that's Ajax. Uh, we have comments in the language, uh, two forms, slash, slash, and slash, star, uh, line comments or block comments. I highly recommend using just the line comment. Um, it turns out regular expressions can sometimes have uh, slash star happening within them. Um, so um, if you're trying to comment out code that contains a regular expression, you might accidentally end the comment early and cause your program to be misinterpreted. That can't happen with the slash slash convention. So that's safer, I think. Um, being a C family language, we have all of the operators that you would expect to see in a C family language. Uh, but some of them work a little bit differently. And I'll just talk about uh, some of the differences. Addition is used, or the plus sign is used for both addition and concatenation. This turns out to have been a bad mistake. Uh, this was inspired by Java, which also does that. But Java is a strongly typed language, so you can predict which one it's going to do. Uh, JavaScript is a loosely typed language, so which it does depends on the types of the values, which might not be known to you at the time that you're writing the program. For example, um, say you have a, a, a form field, and you ask the user to type a number into the field, and the user does. And then you pull the value out of that field, and then you want to add it to a total. Everybody thinks it's a number except HTML, which doesn't know about numbers. It only knows about strings. So it'll take that, and, and JavaScript will receive a string and go, well, I don't add strings. I concatenate strings. And so it'll concatenate it together. Um, so that's how you get things like uh, $3 plus 4 gets you $34 instead of $7. Um, so the, the defense against that is if there's any chance that one of the operands is not a number, you got to make sure that it is a number. So you could use the uh, plus prefix operator to do that. Uh, you, or you could use the, the number function, or you could use parseint. But I, I like the plus operator because it's small. 
But the problem with it is, is you're putting plus next to a plus, which could look like the plus plus operator. So now you're looking at a whole other problem. Um, so to avoid that, I recommend, if there's any potential for that confusion, wrap it in parentheses to make sure that doesn't occur. Um, you can divide two integers and produce a result which is not an integer because the language doesn't have integers. And not only will it not be an integer, it, it will also not be exact for reasons we talked about earlier. Uh, we have a percent operator which is not the scale by 100 operator um, and it's also not the modulo operator, it's the remainder operator. The difference between modulo and, and, and uh, remainder is what you do if you have a negative number. With modulo, you expect the answer of this expression to be seven, uh, but it's remainder, and so it's minus one again, which uh, might be surprising from people coming from C. Um, we have equality operators. Um, unfortunately, they do type coercion, um, and they do type coercion before they compare things for equality, and that coercion can cause false positives, which is a bad thing. So I recommend always use the triple equal operator uh, instead, which is unfortunate because it's uglier, but um, you have to. So the reason for that is, I'm trying to find the pattern in here. Um, there's no transitivity at all. You know, transitivity says if, if A and B are equal and B and C are equal, then A and C should be equal, but they're not. You know, so again, we've got these mathematical absurdities going on where transitivity doesn't hold. Um, and, and it should. Um, so my expectation is that all of these should produce false because in every case, what's on the left side is different than what's on the right side. Um, and with the triple equal operator, it does the right thing. You actually get false in all the cases. So I recommend always, always use the triple equal operator. There might be times when you think you want the type coercion, but you should only do that if you actually understand what the type coercion will do. And I challenge anybody looking at this to guess what the conventions are. Um, so looking at this, you know, equal, double equal, triple equal, how did this happen? Um, Fortran actually kind of got it right. It used equal for assignment and the EQ operator for equality. So it was always obvious which one you're going to be doing. Algol 60 took a different approach. They used equal sign for equality and they used colon equal uh, for assignment. Um, and again, there's no confusion of that. Some languages tried to use an arrow in that position instead of colon equal, which actually looks very nice. Um, but most language designers are reluctant to use any non-ASCII characters in their uh, programming languages. Um, and the reason for that is because programmers are not smart enough to figure out how to type in any characters that are not printed on the keyboard. Um, Basic used equality or used equal sign for both assignment and equality, but um, did it in particular positions uh, within statements. Um, so it disambiguated that way. It didn't allow use of uh, assignment as an expression. Uh, and then in JavaScript, um, we've got equal for assignment and triple equal for equality. Uh, we've got uh, the logical AND operation. I sometimes call it the guard operator. Um, if the first operand is truthy, the result is the second operand. Otherwise, the result is the first operand. Um, and it can be used to avoid null references. So here, um, if A is truthy, I'll return its A member. But if it's falsy, which it would be if it's null or, or undefined, then I'll just return it itself. I can do exactly the same thing by saying return a uh, ampersand ampersand a dot member. So much more compact, more streamlined. Uh, even more useful is the logical or operator, also called the default operator. It's sort of the opposite of the other one. If the first operand is truthy, return the first operand, otherwise return the second operand. So we can use this to fill in um, default values. So here I've got an input. The input might be empty or the input might have a value in it. If it has a value in it, the value will go into last. If it doesn't have a value in it, then number items will go in instead. Um, we have the exclamation point, which is the logical not operator. Um, if the operand is truthy, um, then the result is false. Otherwise, the result is true. 
And if you put two of them together, um, it uh, produces booleans. So you can take any truthy value, uh, put bang bang in front of it, and it turns into true. We have bitwise operators in this language. Now, bitwise operators are usually used on integer values, particularly on machine values. Um, we don't have those in this language. So the way they work is they'll take your 64-bit floating point number, uh, turn it into a 32-bit integer, do the deed on them, and then turn it back into floating point and then on. So sometimes, particularly people coming from C will think, I could do a shift and that's going to be faster than a multiply, so I'll, I'll do that. That's not going to be a win in this language. So don't do a shift unless you really intend to shift. If, if what you're really trying to do is a multiply, then code clearly, write the multiply. The right thing will probably be faster. Uh, we have a familiar set of statements in, in this language, and most of them work similarly as in other languages. Um, we have a labeled break statement, as we have in Java, which can allow us to break out of nested loops. That, that's a useful thing. Um, we have a for in statement, which allows us to loop through all the members of an array. Um, we have the, the for in statement, which you have to guard, but as I showed earlier, the, the guard it doesn't always work. Uh, we have a switch statement, which is a multi-way branch that was inspired by the Fortran computed go-to. Um, it has a fall-through hazard in it. We'll talk about uh, that hazard on, on another evening. Um, it, JavaScript actually improves on the traditional uh, switch statement because uh, the case values can be strings. They don't have to be numbers. So you can match against values that you're actually using. That's a huge advantage. Also, you can have expressions in the cases. They don't have to be constants. Um, so that can be nice for foreign applications in which you want to uh, uh, be able to compute values based on the, the local language, for example, and plug those straight into the case statement. That's also very nice. So a, a switch statement uh, can look like this. You have some number of, of case expressions. And if any of those match, then we'll go to that piece of code. Um, the hazard in here is that you have to explicitly break or disrupt somehow after each case, otherwise you'll fall into the next case. And that's a, a really common programming error. Uh, we can throw exceptions in this language. Um, there's a, uh, a, an error constructor that you can use to, to make um, exception objects. Or you can just throw in an object literal that does the same thing. Um, you can throw anything you want. Um, because we don't have um, uh, uh, exception classes, there's only one catch clause in a try block. So it'll catch everything that comes through. But then you can look at the thing and decide what to do about it. You either want to um, throw it up or, or ignore it or return or whatever you want to do, you can deal with it there. Um, <clears throat> the JavaScript engine itself can throw a number of exception types, error, eval error, range error, all these. So. Um, they tend not to happen very much. It, um, the language tends to be too permissive, so it doesn't throw exceptions very often. Uh, but if it does, it'll be one of these. Um, finally, we've got <clears throat> the with statement. This is another of those good intention features. Um, so uh, first we'll have a little drill. In, in green, we've got a with statement uh, with some object foo equals coda. It will, what it will do is one of those four statements. Can you guess which one it's going to do? Well, it's a trick question. It could do any of them. <laughs> and there's no way you can tell from reading the program which it's going to do. Which it will do will based, be based on the composition of O, which is something you cannot determine by reading the program. So if we want to expand that green program, see exactly what it's going to do, this is what it's going to do. Um, I recommend don't go anywhere near this statement. Um, it, it does not do what you want. It fails uh, very commonly. Uh, it's bad stuff. It was well intended, but it's unnecessary. Uh, there is no code that you can't write better without it. Um, also, um, ES5 strict does not remove many things from the language, but it does remove this. Um, if you ask um, someone who's writing a JavaScript engine, what feature do you hate the most? Uh, it's this in eval. 
And the reason is, simply by being in the language, even if you're not using it, it forces all programs to be slower. Um, so we're, we're getting rid of it. Um, so the ninjas out there are all, are all jumping all over themselves trying to figure out new clever uses for it. Don't do that. Um, don't need it. So that's all I got for you tonight. But uh, we're going to be doing this again real soon. So come back for Act 3, Function the Ultimate. Thank you and good night.